Thank you so much. Um, so I had prepared a slight introductory talk, and then I'll start to regale you with lots of examples of my music, because I hope you'll see that my treatment of the folk materials has changed over the 14 years that I've started to do this. And at the end, Mate and Vizelli and I will play from my very first piece using the Bartok folk sources. What would Bartok have thought today of how his music, the music of his research and world music in general has been radically transformed through mixture with popular cultures, both in Hungary and elsewhere. For example, the modern art orchestra mixing jazz improvisation, electronic soundscapes and spoken word with pieces from the microcosmos, <clears throat> excuse me, young Hungarian composers setting folk music for various ensembles on a regular basis. And the complex interaction between rising generations of trained folk musicians and older master musicians. For me, Bartok is a citizen of the world in his willingness to go on unbeaten paths to get lost and to discover something new. One can only imagine the enormous energy and passion involved in his decades of recording and transcribing music from various cultures, learning the different languages, navigating the unpredictable and considerable challenges of fieldwork and sustaining tremendous energy into finding publishers to give voice to his brilliant conceptions, which he saw as his mission of preserving rapidly changing oral traditions. And all this while maintaining in several parallel universes his multiple lives as a visionary composer and pianist. I realize young Hungarian composers today may choose not to touch their own folk traditions out of tremendous respect, as one has recently told me. But during my time here, exploring the different musical scenes in Budapest, I have found several composers, as well as frequent creative mixtures of Bartok's music performed by classical musicians, interlaced with performances of the same folk melodies interpreted by folk musicians and even folk dancers. Let me introduce how I became interested in using Balkan and Central European folk sources. Though trained as a concert pianist, my growth as a composer was based on initial exposure to Asian composers and traditional Asian music. As Professor Rikarish had mentioned, I started studying composing with Micho Mamiya in Tokyo, who urged me to write for traditional Japanese instruments, as his own music frequently incorporates that of other cultures. As a doctoral composition student at UC Berkeley, I studied and played in a Japanese gamelan and helped Hugh de Ferranti, a colleague, transcribe Biwa performers' sung epic recitations collected during his doctoral fieldwork in Kyushu, Japan. Of mixed Macedonian Slovenian background, for years I was hesitant to approach the music of my own multiple heritages. Was it too familiar, too special? <clears throat> After all, I had been conservatively trained in Western classical music and by the 90s viewed myself as a young composer with much to catch up on. Exploring all facets of new music I could find, including complexity and computer algorithms. My graduate training was mainly oriented towards developments in Europe. To balance this out, having been inspired by my Japanese experiences, I would take occasional courses in ethnomusicologies and even ended up marrying one. To jump ahead 15 years as faculty at Boston University, I randomly ran across Bartok's publication, Yugoslav Folk Music, <clears throat> excuse me, on the library shelf. I felt a strange kind of shock. The combination of the word Yugoslavia, something my parents would often say out of nostalgia, as this is where they had met and where I was soon after was born, and something written by Bartok, whose ethnographic research I had only heard about. Well, I simply could not ignore this moment. Thus began my ongoing love affair with Bartok's ethnographic research. The genesis of Yugoslav folk music as a publication is interesting to explore, as it helped launch Bartok's last years in America. After Bartok had given a lecture recital at Harvard, <clears throat> April 22, 1940, as part of a whirlwind five-week concert tour of the States, his second visit to America, through the invitation of Albert Lord, <clears throat> Bartok was made aware of Harvard University's collection of recordings.
my lord and his teacher Milton Carey of Bosnian and Herzegovinian sun epics, descendants of Homerian epics. Bartok was excited by the extent and completeness of the collection and the sheer length of some of the recordings. One epic lasted 12 hours and looked for a way to return to this particular collection. The wizardry of Perry's recordings were due to the fact that for the second of their two trips, Perry had brought a special system of twin turntables using 12 inch aluminum discs custom made by the Sound Specialties Company in Waterbury, Connecticut. So as to not interrupt the singer during recording, a switch directed the signal to the second turntable when the first disc was full and the first disc was flipped over to allow a continuation of recording. And so this would go on and on for multiple discs. During Bartok's own years of field recording, he used wax cylinders, which could record only up to three minutes or about three to four stanzas of a song. The Perry collection provided Bartok with an opportunity to look into long standing questions about Serbo Croatian music, which had interested him since he first collected the Serbian melody in 1910. In 1940 to 1942, while in residence at Columbia University in New York, Bartok transcribed much of Perry's field recordings. Sadly, this is the last body of transcription Bartok would be able to do. <clears throat> in my first composition, inspired by this particular field work, Postcards from the 1930s, I set 14 of the women's songs as encore pieces for my violin duo. I later returned to Macedonian instrumental and children's songs in the same collection for my work Five Moments from 2019. The actual character of the Gusle player who accompanies himself while singing epics, the main subject actually of the Milman Perry collection, inspired my second opera, The Fiddler and the Old Woman of Rumelia, based entirely on Balkan and Central European folk songs and stories. I would like today to show my own progression, starting from setting from postcards with piano responding to the folk singer and various types of written out improvisation. In subsequent works, I explore different ways to use folk gestures, splitting them into fragments, mixing them with other sources, and combining them with abstract textures. In addition to my chamber opera, I will discuss examples from Five Moments, Double Images, Sea Changes, The Moon Returns, and my most recent work, composed last summer for this occasion, actually, Climbing and Freefall. Showing original source transcriptions, playing source recordings, which I could locate through the help of Biro Viola, at the Bartok Archives, David Elmer at the Milman Perry Collection at Harvard University, and most recently the Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana University, I will show corresponding examples from my own music. At the end, Mate and I will perform selections from postcards. We must continue to try to answer the questions Bartok asked about relationships between various cultures. As a teacher myself, I urge young artists to develop a deep curiosity of what is going on in other countries. The creative energy unleashed from the constant and unpredictable mixture of various traditions can only be imagined. I would like to thank Laszlo Vicarius for his gracious invitation to this talk and to Viola Biro for sending Bartok's recordings of Romanian flute and violin melodies and their countless words of wisdom and insight. So now <clears throat> I'll begin I can't get out of this one, Rudy. By talking about five moments. There we go. Okay. Let's see if I can get a better view. <clears throat> Here we go. Okay. Uh, so this is one of the first pieces 
Let me get rid of this little thing. I don't know where to put it. That's very important part. Uh, one of the first pieces uh, in the five moments, short pieces for cello and piano. And here, in addition to uh, transcriptions of Macedonian children's songs and uh, instrumental music, I mixed in some of my old quotations of Herzegovinian songs from postcards. So I'm starting to quote myself in a very interesting way, which composers often do when they start to get old. Uh, as you can see here, for those of you who know this, I apologize, it might be a review, as I tell my students, but I know I have some students listening. We can see here a skeletal melody. You can see the, ma the mouse, okay? And the ornamentations, meticulously written by Bartok, with, uh, uh, in, in certain cases, an interesting key signature, A flat. <clears throat> G is the final tone. And this part up here is very interesting. We have five plus five, five plus five, five plus six, and five, and then seven to seven. And here we have, can I point at the screen, Rudy? And that was one of the ways Bartok would classify his material, as well as the range of the music going from seven scale degrees up to seven above, with one being G, because all the melodies were transposed to G. So here's a schema. Basically, in most of his publications, you'll find this little chart. Uh, the syllable indications are very important for him, and he said, for example, how many syllables per uh, text syllables per melody section. So five plus five, five plus five, five plus six and five are the number of syllables. And what's interesting, he's finding so many ways to indicate importance in melodic weight. We have larger note text. Uh, these kind of slurs before the note, which take away from the value of the main note. And also the meticulous rhythms here of the 64th notes in the first measure. Okay. This triplets, this uh, little arrow here showing the A is a little bit above regular tuning. And this is all for an oral tradition. So his conception of how to record, and he would listen to a melody, he said about 100 times, slowing down the, uh, the cylinder machine by half. And also in the Perry collection, going from 78 to 33, to try to capture as much as possible all the details of one particular performance. OK, so uh, as far as this particular song among the uh, songs in the Perry collection they're very um, earthy and very uninnocent I would say so for this one a man is enticing a married woman to come sit by her side uh, let's sit on the bench next to the sea and she protests I say and then he says listen come and sit with me I'll buy you some shoes and I'll even buy you a veil to take you to my white house briefly. So uh, I'll play this. Uh, these recordings are from the Millman Terry collection at Harvard. Grana Odebora Grana Kremora Grana Odebora Okay, so that gives you some idea. Uh, Bartok found that this style of ornamentation in his Bosnian and Herzegovinian transcriptions was quite different from Romanian, for example, or Hungarian or Slovak, in that it was very heavy. The ornamentation was very heavy and very elaborate. 
Uh, he would say, for example, the Romanian ornamentation functioned to get from one main note to another, like glissando or subtle slides, but the, this style was very elaborate and rich. And uh, he conjectured it was from the Turkish influence because this whole area was under Turkish occupation, the Ottomans, for a number of centuries. Uh, in the first piece also I have, oh, sorry. A tambura, a little bit of a tambura introduction. And I thought, as a composer, what inspires me when I look at this material? Because you don't just set it with the piano. You try to manipulate it, uh, fragment it, use certain gestures, extract certain gestures in a number of ways. So I thought, well, great, this opening uh, melody. Great for cello, open strings of the cello that immediately came to mind. Okay, so that gives you some idea. And finally, this is my piece. I'll play the whole thing, it's short. Uh, you'll hear the tambura introduction. The piano functions as a kind of a reverb in different detuned overtones of the tambura. And then there is a session with the song, the Herzegovinian song.
So that was uh, from the CD with cellist Lawrence Stomberg and myself. Uh, one more example from this piece I'd like to show is some of my favorite folk uses, uh, the bagpipe. It's absolutely incredible instrument and sound, has so many associations. So here's a short excerpt. What do you want to And this goes on for quite a while. Uh, in this piece, I detuned one of the cello strings to create kind of a nice resonance, I hope, as you hear. And the piano is nothing but, again, a resonance of the cello. So I won't play the whole piece, but I want to give you a flavor. Sorry, I don't have a volume knob to turn it off, but that gives you some idea. Um, maybe one more example, only because it was one of the newer pieces. I uh, quoted quite a few of these uh, kolos, which are rapid round dances, as you might know in the Balkans. They hold hands, circle around, a lot of fancy footwork that's very fast. And uh, So for example, here's one. And the duduk, I believe, is like a caval, peasant flute. Okay, and I combined several of these quotations in the final movement of this piece. Okay, uh, for this particular one, the cello becomes the flute, oddly enough, and the piano is playing one of the earlier quotations. it's in polyrhythms so I'm starting to have fun mixing I thought two against three should be straightforward but it's one of the most challenging pieces I have to, to uh, put together but we always have to try something new okay so moving on to use of Romanian folk material this is Macedonian one Herzegovina song I will speak about a piece called double images is for violin and piano. Okay. Okay, so it's about time. Again, I'd like to play an entire movement, which is fairly short, but uh, we get a better. Okay. Violin is using folk material in this particular movement. I woke up and remembered it is a quote from Anna Kmatova as part of my opera, Lena and the Wolf, about uh, Prokofiev's wife, Lena. 
And um, I literally woke up and remembered last time quite a few things I wanted to add to this talk. So I thought it was appropriate to play this. The violin, as I mentioned before, is the folk material and the piano now shows some of the textures that I use in my other kinds of music uh, generated by computer algorithms. So we see a progression of chords that keeps repeating and lengthening. And you can actually hear this. There's a tremendous amount of redundancy in it. But I thought it would create a nice backdrop to the folk material. And this performance is from the CD with Katie Wolf, violinist. So the source from that is marvelous tune, the tremendous amount of rhythmic precision and changing meters almost per measure. And just to give you a taste of this. Okay. So I'd like to move on to a more recent treatment, also of Romanian materials, uh, climbing and free fall. So here it's almost a Baroque like movement climbing, which is a series of chords in the violin getting higher. And as you can imagine, free fall is like everything slowly, slowly descending. Uh, here are a couple of the sources. Is a flute? Oh, this 
is the uh, archive website. Which I was so delighted last summer when Viola showed me. They have so many things up showing Bartok's original sketches. MH 3600. Is this Bartok? that and just a little excerpt i recorded this last summer with robin julian in denver okay so now the piano has it it's mixed quite back and forth between the piano and the violin uh, there's another melody we have in the piano part. So in a way, this becomes much more chromatic. Tunes are fragmented, shifted. And I'd like to show you a little example from Free Fall. Okay. Which is actually, actually an A minor scale in the violin, continually descending, but then jumping up and down in different octaves. And of course, that was the backdrop for me conceptually leading. And then a series of piano chords which had. Fibonacci relations between them. That's some of my favorite things to do. So we have here three, two, one, two, three, essentially. There's no folk material here yet, but I just want to give you the beginning. Okay, and we were experimenting with ways to make this sound folk-like. Neither Robin or I had experience, but discussing with Mate, who was trained as a folk musician, he was uh, describing how the trill is made with two fingers as kind of a vibrato, and that's what we had actually done here. So I was very happy I emailed Robin. And I realized also in the flute music, Bartok was saying that the kind of trill is literally moving the finger on and off the hole very quickly. So we kind of luckily guessed something in advance. And then finally, uh, the folk melody here bursts through. You can see it in the violin part from 80. It comes little by little. It emerges through the texture, and then it lasts for the rest of the piece. I'd like to show you that. Here it is. Oh, it's one of the website. Let's do that. Okay. M H hanger. So you kind of get a feeling for that. Okay, and finally I'll play this example.
So that's climbing in free fall. Uh, the next piece I wanted to explore were some Hungarian quotations, finally, from the host country in a piece for viola and piano, also for cello and piano. Often I retranscribe things for violin or viola because whoever's around. Uh, so this is uh, a little bird. And I was delighted to find on a recent CD, the same piece uh, by Kodai, a setting for string orchestra. So it has kind of a long history, and we actually have this original performance from the archives. There we go. That's that. And I see it's two minutes, 29 seconds, so the wax cylinder is in effect here. This piece actually uses two Hungarian songs, two Romanian folk songs, and two Turkish folk songs. Uh, it's called Seed Changes, I may have mentioned. And this is a recording from the CD Double Images by violist Daniel Donia. And the, like a lot of my music, each time I come back and play these pieces with other performers, I ask them to suggest ideas, changes. Uh, it's kind of a constant process of uh, editing or discovering some new voice, I think. And I like to think of it because in folk music, each performance of a melody is quite different. And even Bartok had noted that aspect in his own music that it was a continual repeat of material, but always varied in some ways. Um, let's see, how are we for time? I'd like to move on to some Turkish quotations in a flute piece that I recorded with Gergely Itzesh, a Hungarian composer. 
And again, this piece was written much longer ago. And then when he had a chance to look at it, I was very inspired by his use of double stops. He created a whole system of flute double stops. And I thought, wow, let's, let's put some of these double stops in here. So besides just one or two, the piece really transformed itself. And so I had to retitle it entirely. What really catches me about the Turkish material is its extreme conceptual uh, gesture. Actually, they're descending lines with a lot of melismas. It's a fast and quick way of describing this kind of music. It's uh, Anatolian shepherd music. Uh, Bartok had a chance for field work when he went for a concert tour in 36. He worked with Saigon and they went into the fields and part of the problem was the the uh, Turkish people didn't trust this stranger, so Saigon had to say, look, Bartok is just Turkish, but they forgot how to speak Turkish because they've lived abroad for so long. So they concocted this amazing sentence, and I must find it. In the cotton field are much barley and many apples, camels, tents, axes, boots, and young goats. So by saying that, they kind of warmed up their, their uh, informers. Uh, Bartok actually wasn't too happy with his field work results because he couldn't record women. Uh, this was Muslim society. Women did not perform for uh, strangers or they don't perform in public. The big difference in the Perry collection is they are women's songs uh, because Perry and Lord knew about this problem and they had two Muslim assistants with them to talk to the locals and then a local muezzin invited them into their home to record. So the women figured, well, this is a little safer and more respectable. And so they actually sang for the Perry collection without their veils, which is quite remarkable, I think, at that time. Uh, so these are all men singing. And uh, he didn't have much time to verify lots of the transcription material. Uh, it was a very hasty work. But he still, he managed about how many? 90 songs, 64 cylinders, which is quite a lot. Okay, so what I'd like to do, play a couple of these. I use multiple sources in this piece for flute and piano. Just give you an idea. And you can see here, the little D uh, in the bass clef shows that's the original tonic of this singer. This song has been transposed to end on G. And he used the bass clef for male singers and the female, uh, the treble clef for female singers. Uh, let's see about the text. I came down from the fortress, downwards, my handkerchief is full of fruit. I sent them to my sweetheart. All about love. Uh, I actually quoted a few dances. Let me get the full screen. And this is for uh, Zurna, which is an oboe with a very thick sound, and the val, a drum with two types of sticks, a heavier stick in the right hand, lighter in the left, and it's held in front of the performer. And this is also a very big tradition in Macedonia, where I was born, the oboe drum traditions. So I was thrilled to find this. Okay, 
and to show from this piece itself, here is an example of lots of multiphonics in the flute. Uh, Gary was absolutely brilliant at that. The piano has also the melody kind of in canon and the left hand, some of the drum rhythms. Uh, this was a free use of the material. I didn't preserve an entire song at all. I preserved fragments. I often started chopping them up in different ways. Uh, so here, I'll have you hear it. So I realize I probably ran out of time, so I won't talk about my folk opera, but I will direct you to the website where the recording is there, a bit of a description of how it's been put together. I'm very proud because the artwork is by my brother, David Ness. Okay, so you can entertain yourself. Uh, this is a recording of the concert version, and it was quite fun because we found, for example, concert, uh, the clothing from a local Bul Bulgarian researcher. She had done a lot of work in Bulgaria with an epic singer. So we were able actually to find clothing from the area. Uh, so that was quite a bit of fun. And this mixes stories and songs from all over the Balkans and Central Europe. It's an hour plus long, it's quite big. So I think I probably should talk about postcards and play with Mate. Um, I'll give a brief introduction because I actually have some of the source recordings. Pictures, again from Harvard, of the singers they worked with, these old epic singers. I find them very very striking, very handsome. Okay. We'll be playing a brief sad letter first. Let me uh, play the sources. Same system of categorization by now in 1940s has been well established by Bartok. We've got the syllables. We've got the range of the melody from one to flat three, uh, the kind of Schenker graph. I like to joke with my students of the melody itself. The incredible key signature of A flat, quarter tone higher, and B flat. Okay. Each of these texts are ripping and, and, and very vivid. Here's a sad letter to a man. He looked at it, complained to his mother. This is from another rich man who says that Haikuna, his beloved, is untrue and no longer mine. And besides, he asks for my brown horse for the girl to ride in their wedding uh, procession. So this is broken love stories. This was a Dalmatian example of two sopile oboes, initially um, played and then sung by the same performers. And I think I've been looking for 14 years for this excerpt, and I found it a couple days ago through some clever uh, leads by uh, Professor Vicarios and Viola to the Indiana archives. Um, so I just have to play it because it's an example of the uh, dissonant chromaticism that really attracted Bartok's ear. And he actually thought he had invented this in his music, calling it new chromaticism is one of his Harvard lectures. And he had to admit, actually, 
I then heard it in some Dalmatian recordings and realized there's really nothing new under the sun. Someone has thought of it before. And I do have this link. Hmm. Let me refresh this. Hello, Indiana, Bloomington. Here we are. Oh boy. It's just disappeared after 14 years. It's vanished again. Okay, well, I may have better luck later. This is one of the pieces we're playing. Okay, beside the crystal waters of a brook. I don't have the recording for that. You can see some of the elaborate ornamentation. By Sarajevo, there's a green garden, another one for which I don't have the uh, recording. Jeha falling asleep by the sea. Here I do have this recording, another Dalmatian example of they couldn't even translate this. It was uh, a Lord who was helping to translate all the song texts along with the aid of a Yugoslav coworker. But here is, my daughter, you mustn't have anything to do with anyone, either good or bad, for my heart is filled with sorrow. So this is the point of view of the mother. <laughs> Quite something. Uh, then the uh, old mother of Jafferbeg, who actually launched my opera, because this story is so gruesome. Uh, let me play it for you and then I'll tell you the story. Ritambora, good singer. some of the story. Uh, Lord discusses 45 other texts in their collection with the following variants. So apparently this probably happened in the culture. An old mother begins to weep. My foolish child, what have you brought us? You have brought us a foolish young thing, more foolish than you. She's complaining about her daughter-in-law. Your wife will not heed me. So he took his mighty sword from its peg. And then you can imagine what happens next. He kills the wife or he kills the baby. And there are many um, variants of what happens next. So I thought, gosh, this is really a potent story. And I showed it to a playwright. And she said, this is your opera. This story can really launch an opera. So then I had to think very hard and look at all the stories from everywhere. But this was underlining the whole opera. OK, I think that ends this Zoom, I mean, the, the PowerPoint part of the talk. And Mate and I will play now. <laughs> 